Wir hatten gerade schon das spannende Thema mit Power oder Hallo. Um, hello. Um, this is a talk about is about power, about computation power. Uh, to to uh, at home, you work at uh, City at Home um, for Search for Aliens. Uh, Dieter Kanzmüller will uh, from the Super MOOC. Um, he will um, start talk, give a talk, and uh, the translators are uh, Kaste and Tatzelbrum. We are translating the German to English. Hello, <laughs> hello. Thanks for the good introduction and uh, good evening. Uh, you have noticed that uh, he has said something wrong. This is not that talk in German, this is a talk in Austrian, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put in an effort. <laughs> the subject of the talk, uh, SuperMOOC NG, is... Uh, uh, NG stands for Next Generation, as in Star Trek. Uh, the subtitle has get gotten lost, uh, but that was uh, important. Uh, where are we in the race for the fastest computer in the work, and what does NG have to do with it uh, before I... I want to start with the core motivation. <laughs> It's about this, the Munich Tatort. Uh, a, a TV show was uh, turned here. This, uh, this is uh, the people are not in the room here, but this was uh, this was an interesting story because everything was uh, up, up, toppled upside down because uh, there was a movie turned and nothing worked. And in the background, you see the super MOOC. And that was a story. I don't want to. Uh, tell you this, the contents of the story, it was about artificial intelligence. Uh, the interesting thing about this story was uh, what, hap what happened to, uh, this, as soon as this was uh, transmitted, on the next day there were the first uh, phone calls. The first calls were some newspaper that said, uh, what the hell are you doing here in Gauching? And then were questions like, how dangerous is this? Uh, what are you doing? What can what else can you do with this uh, apparatus? And those are things where I thought about. Uh, and that's uh, many people in the room uh, have the same are in the same situation. Uh, nobody, hardly anybody, understands what we're doing. And this is the same thing with the supermark. Uh, you might be the experts of the uh, future of digitalization. Uh, you're closer to it, but it's uh, about time that you're looking closer at uh, what is such a supercomputer, what is a super MOOC. Um, and uh, one or the other who didn't see the Tatort might have uh, seen a movie by Edward Snowden, and in this uh, movie the super MOOC is, there, is in there too, because because they were not allowed to uh, to take a movie at uh, at the NSA and they asked us to turn to do the movie uh, at our place and there are some scenes in there where Super Mook uh, is playing in the background there are scenes also where our sys admins uh, the people who administer the system uh, are running through the picture as cameos <laughs> and that gives the movie more authenticity and one of the pictures uh, in the Snowden movie was this one, where I have to say that uh, for copyright reasons I have done that myself. That's not in the movie, but you see the same thing in the f in the movie, but the, um, the lights on top are, are off and it looks more futuristic. So what you see is uh, Super MOOC Phase 1 and Phase 2. And there the, um, the deers are in the behind. Uh, Super MOOC 1 is... Um, what you see in the background, then the two rows in the front are the Super MOOC 2, and th the room has uh, 1,200 meters square meters, and it's um, pretty filled. The empty space uh, is for the uh, movie, for the t for the TV show Tardot, um, the empty. Uh, the interesting thing is the power. The phase one. Uh, 600 square meters is uh, 3.2 petaflops, and uh, the two uh, rows in front are 3.6 petaflops. And everybody is supposed to know what the petaflop is. Uh, this is also my. Uh, he also wears the t petaflop T-shirt. It's uh, 10 to the 15th uh, floating point operations per second. It's a one with 15 zeros. And that was one petaflop is in calculation power, computational power. That's phase one, 3.2. Uh, 
with 15 zeros and uh, three points. It's actually 14 zeros because it's a point decimal point. But uh, okay, yeah, that's what they can calculate. And if the media call, that's what does that mean? It's uh, it's it's 17. If it's uh, 17,000 uh, people at the 55, is it uh, some billions of uh, of? Of, uh, of calculation power, is this calculation power, what the uh, devices are capable of. The interesting thing is that in tw 2012, the half of the room in the background had 3.2 petaflops, and in two 2015, the uh, two rows in front 3.6 petaflops. So in within three years, we only need a quarter of the room and a third of the of the current, and get the same computational power. And that's the uh, increase in computational power, and that's the reason why we always get new uh, devices, where because there is uh, a point where it's uh, cheaper to get the new device than to uh, operate the old device. And we see in this example that the the uh, computational power is. Uh, is based on the um, uh, computational cores. It's uh, 230,000 uh, computational cores. The intention is that these computational cores uh, c uh, calculate collectively in parallel and that they use everything available and they can do use um, large calculations and uh, there's a memory requirements that match it and there's a current requirements uh, in this case uh, it's uh, the power consumption is a small city with 30,000 uh, households. The free room in the space is uh, for the Tatort movie or Tatort show, and then uh, we put this in there. And this is the SuperMOOC NG, which is at the time uh, Germany's fastest compu co computer, which is 26.7 petaflops and 311,000 uh, calculation cores, and they should all work together. <laughs> And be used for the application. Uh, main memory is 307 terabytes. We have all the uh, digital pages in the uh, ba 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 Bavarian National Bibliothek uh, Library, but uh, they would comfortably fit in there. Before we go into the details, we go to the background. Why do we need such a system at all? Why did we decide to uh, get that? There's the Gauss Center for Supercomputing, that's a, that's a society that's been created for the national uh, supercomputing super compu uh, things, uh, the HLRS Institute, the Jülich Supercomputer Center and the uh, in Munich Center. For the, so for the um, scientific community, get the highest uh, calculational power. <laughs> There have been uh, agreements between the state and the uh, federal state of uh, Germany, so half and half uh, between Bavaria and the uh, national level. If you look at it closely, this is the, uh, the proposal for the project for, for the uh, time range of 2017 to 2025. Uh, in total, it's a sum of 450 million euros. We, we take care to uh, construct those highest performance computings uh, in order to support this kind of uh, research that is done on high, for, for, for very high computing demand. We also have to take care that we uh, select the projects that will have the ability to run on that system. So it's available to all of the uh, German researchers and they can propose projects that will run on this. There's a board uh, with scientific members that select the projects that will be allowed to run. So there are specific requirements for the systems. If you look at the, um, the LRZ, which is the organization that runs the system, it should, be, it should have uh, a, a fairly broad spectrum of applications that can run on this. And there are the the specific uh, areas that we can uh, that we that we look at it are the astro geo uh, life sciences and uh, environmental sciences as well as various uh, areas of physics, uh, fluid mechanics, and chemistry. So we take a closer look at this, and 
What I want to do is uh, light, shed some light on certain aspects. In the past, there were students who basically did it as a job that they, they were plugging together all the, the hardware and then install some software on it and then run the software on it. But here, there's a bit more of a process around this and more requirements. 2016, we started uh, started a proposal in a, a platform called Simap, where if you think about it, 2016, the system was already installed, and we're now two two years past this timeline. And if we now look back, that 2015 we installed the the older system that. The result is that we basically, the, the moment we have installed it, we already have to think about constructing and designing the new system. So we went into a dialogue with the uh, various partners to uh, uh, fix the, the legal requirements around this. We also have to put down the criteria and the guidelines in advance before constructing the system to uh, show that what we're going to offer. There are also NDAs involved. And it also needs to match what we have regarding the, the space requirements and the cooling systems. So on the 23rd of January, the first um, applicants were bringing proof that they're supported in their financial needs and their economic capabilities. So in order to uh, to know if they, they they also have to name a reference installation for us to um, to prove for us that they can handle the requirements in regards to energy efficiency and cooling. So the question is, who is actually capable of constructing such a system? And there's only a very small number of companies around the world who are actually capable of doing this kind of thing. In the first round, we. We looked at five companies who are capable of that. We basically met with all of the applicants uh, three times. They had to give us a proposal. This is a very interesting process that we went through. It, it took a lot of human capital that was involved in, in selecting the, the, the final contender. There were at least 25 people involved at any given time. So in the second round, when after we we uh, went through all of the three rounds of the f first five companies, we narrowed it down to two. So both of them had the chance to basically give us the best offer, and we got this description of goods and services. I chose three that I wanted to show you. They have different colors. Red is mandatory. Yellow is what is important. It would be nice to have. Green is more of a... Those those are target areas that we wanted to have, but not that important. So basically, this is like a whole list of questions that each vendor has to answer. It's basically, we want a complete description for every... Um, f as an answer for every question. For example, here, the, the, this is relating to cooling. So basically, we get, uh, we get a complete folder full of answers every time we put out one of these catalogs. And there's a few legal requirements around this, especially about antitrust and um, market protection. We're also looking at total cost of ownership, obviously. We're, we said about uh, 40, uh, 64 million. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of money, but it's total cost of ownership. So this, the, the, the hardware, the system, the software, and uh, the maintenance have to all be included, and it may not go over the limit that we set. So it's not possible that after the fact they come around and say, OK, we need a little more. This really is a strict requirement. The, the vendor that is uh, making a proposal really have to make a good suggestion that whatever's left after the buying really needs to be enough for 
running the support for this. Otherwise, the companies themselves have to uh, fund it out of their own pocket. This is a little different than what you do when you uh, buy a laptop, obviously. We need the maximum power for, for the budget that we can get. So there's, there's only going to be one vendor, and there's no uh, side offers. And they're forced to work together. So there's a pretty big window for installing it. We said Q3 18 to Q4 19. So they still have some time to uh, get their act together and to maybe form a partnership even. So it's it's uh, often it's best for them to be in there earliest. There's a whole um, competition going on there between the vendors. And we're going to do uh, measurements to prove the capabilities of the system and to measure the performance. And it needs to be, it, it needs to be tested in regards to functional capabilities. And there's also uh, questions around uh, the proposal where the, the vendor can ask us if they don't understand the questions that we're asking them. So we basically need to always uh, replicate that question from the vendor to all the other vendors so they're in the loop. And this is a lot of effort for us. So we, we really hope that it's, it's easiest and, and most understandable so there's less effort for us. So in the end, hopefully everybody's happy and we signed a contract and you can see it in my, I'm holding it in my hand in the picture that that's the, the contract that I had to sign. And hopefully every detail is in there. This was the 14th of December, 2017. So in total sum, we, we, it took, it, it, it lasted a year for us to, it took us a year to get this done. So here you can see the, the green InfiniBand cables connecting it so those those are the numbers that we got and we're pretty happy about them those are the technical specs that we got for the final system so now we're we're obviously interested in how we compare to all the other fastest systems in the world now so we, let's look at them there's a list that's called the top 500 supercomputers in the world and those are the first 10 spots in the list so there is obviously 490 more down the list. This is updated twice a year, once in June and once in November. Interestingly enough, there were uh, 13,000, um, as a conference of 13,000 participants, it's interesting enough, it's smaller than the 35C3 now. So this is the first system in the list. This is the fastest supercomputer in the world. It's called Summit, and it's it has an IBM Power9 architecture and NVIDIA Volta GPUs. In total, it has 2.4 million cores, and it has a theoretical maximum peak. This is about 200,000 teraflops. This is only if the computer did nothing but calculate all the time. This is, of course, unrealistic. So this is really theoretical. If taking, if all of the cores really were doing nothing but computing all the time, so the second value is the is a lower value. It's the R max. It's called. This is an is an empirically evaluated measurement. It's the maximum performance gathered in the LIN pack. So I just want to mention Oak Ridge National Laboratory is one of the American supercomputing centers. They have codes, and we know all the codes, so the DOE and stuff. Interesting is also the power consumption. It takes about 10 megawatts in power. In Tennessee, the, the electricity is about a sixth of what it would cost here. So for them, it's not that important. This is For us, this is a lot, just because of the, the running costs. Now we look at the first five com computers. Uh, there's a competition, there's a race, and in the current list on place one, and uh, place one is uh, US, and three, uh, third and fourth is, uh, is China, and then there's a Swiss cal computer. Those are prestige projects. And the presidents, like the current American uh, one, uh, are inclined to uh, join in this competition. 
So the Department of Energy has these supercomputers and they have no problems to get uh, get uh, money. If they do environmental science, it wasn't wouldn't be as easy to get money. Uh, naturally, they already have a nice competition. Uh, the computation, uh, the the co computer on uh, on the third rank uh, has a Sunway processor, which is an interesting processor. You know, now you see the connection to politic and the net politic. Um, if you listen to the net politics uh, talk, uh, there is a Chinese uh, variation of that. The Chinese have. Uh, would have uh, liked to build the Taihu Light with Intel processors, but uh, the American president said, no, we have an export sub, uh, and then uh, China just built their own processor. And back then, uh, nobody believed that would, that would be possible, but they uh, they pulled it off in four years. And uh, with uh, with the, uh, with the uh, computational power that that, uh, that matches, and you see how important competition is, and if you look at the importance uh, at the fifth place, uh, that is a conspiracy th theory <laughs> that the that the colleagues in the Switzerland uh, had added two more uh, racks with two with additional uh, graphics boards to get to 21.23 uh, petaflops because before they had 19.3 and if we look on the next list that they wanted to show there was the super MOOC is there which has 19.5 um, that's uh, this a uh, malicious uh, assumption, but they wanted to be ahead of the supermuck. <laughs> this picture here shows from the supercomputing uh, the the award uh, ceremony. There are there's a fr framework here, like uh, the occasion. You see the uh, green uh, noted uh, no, uh, green annotations are the changes in the. Um, and uh, it says that uh, in the top 10, the, our system is uh, the, th the third Chinese one because it's been uh, provided by the uh, by Lenovo company. But in truth, we have a, a contract with the uh, with Intel, and in that uh, in that contract, it says it's Lenovo that's listed and not uh, Intel, and that's uh, the contractual details. It's I can live with this being a Chinese. Uh, computer. Now, if we look closer at our um, system that's uh, on rank, uh, it's eighth rank, we see that there is uh, Lenovo, uh, 305,860 um, cores, and for the Linpack, we haven't used all the uh, cores, we only used 305,000 uh, cores. We have a theoretical uh, peak performance of 26.8 uh, um, uh, petaflop. And uh, 19.5 19 um, petaflops we reached in, re uh, in real life. And we don't have uh, current measurements yet. Um, we haven't done that yet. There are some improvements to be made. Uh, this is not uh, the last uh, thing that we did. Now we need to do some ad additional changes. Now, um, we talked a lot about LINPAC. Uh, what is LINPAC? Uh, LINPAC is a solver for a linear system of equations from Dek Jongara. We see an, a, a linear system of equations on top. This is a benchmark uh, with 64-bit uh, floating point operations in the uh, paper that's described in detail. How does that fit to such a, a computer if we scale this? If we have many processors, we need to look at the Andals, Andals law that the, uh, the speed uh, in increase is increased by the sequential part and Gustafsson's law that uh, uh, we need to paral parallelize uh, the problem to uh, to the amount of the. We need to amount, uh, scale the amount of data with this with the size of the computer. We are in the situation that uh, it doesn't make sense to put in a com computer with uh, more processors if we don't have more data too. We can download this uh, list uh, from an, as an Excel uh, table. And we see uh, the size of the problem, and the n max is the number of uh, uh, variables that need to be solved. And if we look further, and this is the uh, do it yourself round, you can uh, look at this on your own smartphone. There are the links. Um, there is a Google Lint Pack app, and you can install that. And this is on an iPhone 6, for example of my girlfriend <laughs> in this case uh, in this case she has uh, s seven gigaflops as a computational power 
with uh, the same algorithm and we have the possibility to s compare what uh, the SuperMOOC is doing uh, with what we have in our uh, in our pants pocket and we can comp we can compare the computational uh, power okay. uh, the interesting thing at it is that the comp comparability uh, it, we can also look in the past we can also uh, Compare this to the fastest computer in 1988. We have uh, 2.6 uh, gigaflops. An iPhone 7 is three times faster than the fastest computer in 1988. One or the other is might be older than uh, born in 1988. Uh, you see how in, is how um, fascinating uh, this development is. We also see the uh, increase in computational power. The curves uh, that shows how the um, how the uh, computers become faster, how many uh, floating point operations per se per, sec per uh, second we see an exponent we see an exponential growth. this is a log scale in the twenty five uh, years since the beginning of the risk uh, we had a s f we had an increase of uh, a factor of two million from uh, then before that's <laughs> That uh, ties into the previous talk. We are always getting uh, faster. Uh, we, there's the Moore's law. There's this is Moore's law. I'm going to skip this. We also have this exponential growth in Moore's laws. In the parallel computers, there's also a top 500 list. Uh, it's interesting to see that one of the reasons why they get faster is that the uh, number of cores is growing. If we look at the list of 1933, 1993. There is between 10 and 100 pr uh, processors. If we look at the uh, list in 2018, there it's uh, everything. All the computers have about 100,000 cores, and the biggest ones uh, more accordingly. And we can look at uh, the accelerators. And there's a list here. And uh, many of the supercomputers work with uh, GPUs, with graphic processing. Uh, but many of them uh, use accelerators, and they are uh, distributed accordingly. Uh, the most, uh, f the favorite one is the uh, Tesla P100 from NVIDIA. The interesting thing there is that the SuperMOOC doesn't have accelerators. Those are just uh, pure Xeon processors. It's uh, Intel Xeon Platinum, 8174 processors. They have some properties that you can go up with the maximal clock frequency because we have water cooling, we have cooling effects. There are other properties. Those are which are top of the line. There's nothing else but uh, computers in the uh, processors in the laptop computer. It has the advantage that uh, you can just upscale the codes from your laptops. Uh, you could theoretically run Windows on the SuperMac, uh, but that doesn't doesn't match the performance anymore. But the interesting thing is if we look at the water cooling. Here's, here we see one of the boards. We see that the boards are double boards, where there are the two boards with uh, two processors. And we see that these red and blue uh, pipes are with the water pipes. And if we look at it from the back sides, we see the water connectors in and out. And if we look at the whole rack, uh, that it's uh, how it's uh, piped, how it's uh, route routed. We don't put in wa normal water. Usually we cool with uh, usually you cool with um, eight to twelve centigrade water, and but the SuperMOOC is cooled with uh, water at the temperature between forty and fifty centigrade. Why do we want to cool at forty or fifty centigrade? Water still has uh, very nice cooling properties, and the processor is still high, uh, still hotter than the fifty degrees centigrade. As long as the temperature difference is uh, great enough, there is a cooling effect. The question is if the if the water is uh, has 60 or 70 uh, degrees on the other side, uh, how, mu how much uh, energy do we need to cool it down back from 60 to 40 degrees? If we think about how it's looked like outside, we, we uh, need zero energy uh, to uh, take the 40 degree water out, uh, 60 degree water outside. We, can, uh, we need no cooling effort because we just uh, cool it down by ambient uh, temperature. And this is uh, one of the cooling managers. And this is uh, 3,000. We need 3,000 liters uh, per hour per, per rack. But it's also clear that what we have there, the cooling manager, is twice as high as the racks. 
just uh, in order to uh, get all the uh, infrastructure in there. And the double uh, double ceiling has a height of one meter eighty, so that uh, can all be put together. So that we do a few more tricks too. We don't need uh, we don't need fans per node. We save a lot of cur uh, electricity by that. We can scale down the uh, the jobs. We do job frequency scaling. We uh, adjust the clock frequency so that it's optimal for the code that we run. There are some heuristics that tell us that, and we need uh, fifteen percent. We get fifteen percent uh, gain by um, cooling uh, by cooling ambient uh, water. That's um, we see the uh, Leibniz, uh, Leibniz uh, Center with uh, five buildings. There is this uh, cube uh, which has 10,000 square meters on five floors. Uh, you see on the floor, you see on the ceiling uh, the boxes which are cooling uh, two megawatts. And what's important here is that uh, this is a cross section of the building from the basement where the transformers are up to the uh, super performance computer that this all has to play together. Whatever we do, needs to be a holistic uh, approach, uh, which is why we uh, developed something where we uh, optimize not not just uh, for the op for the cu current consumption, not just the system software, but also the application that determines what uh, current is uh, is required and and the building is uh, is is uh, designed to respond to the uh, power requirement. And this is uh, sh uh, how how the how the demand is. What happens if the demand is needed? You see the current consumption for uh, one run of Linpack, which is started around 20 o'clock, which is running into 19, 9 a.m. And we start with 800 uh, with only the 800 kilowatts when the operating system is just running. When the job is started, it goes from 800 kilowatts to three megawatts. And what's uh, in What's in addition is the also the cooling, so we need uh, more than 3.5 megawatts, and that's what the infrastructure has to deliver. That is has to sustain. And once the start, job is started, that runs up and goes down again. And that sense, Lindpack is the uh, peak uh, load, and we can see that this curve of for the current consumption. Uh, it's we see uh, it zoomed out. We have an, it's a weird, an odd amount of current, and there is a lot of opti optimization potential that we can do. On the other hand, is Linkpack also a reliability test for the infrastructure? We see a output uh, box for the with the fuses. You also see the two uh, per per power connections to the left and the right left the closed one, right the open ones. And what happened is that one of these Linpack uh, runs, the box looked like this. You see that the top of the, the, the lid has actually molten down by the heat that was produced in that box. Why does something like that happen? This also happens at home. Sometimes if you tinker with stuff, with the wrong stuff, here it happens because uh, here it's a problem is because the human that uh, put that in uh, didn't uh, tighten the screws. So you had arcing, uh, voltage uh, voltage arcing, and that heated up the uh, the, the box, and uh, that has caused the failure. Uh, the Linpack is, um, is the benchmark to find out what... Um, what problems happened? And this is sec this is kind of a secret that we use Linpack for failure checks. Uh, this these are the transformers. This is the transformer number eleven. There are at least eleven. Uh, there are actually twelve transformers. And this was at the open house. Uh, that was interesting because I went there at uh, out at half past nine, half past eight. Uh, I thought that everybody went walk was out. The most of the people uh, were over there and there was a massive uh, loss of power that was caused by the transformer number 11. 
that's if you see uh, the sign, it has 1600 uh, kilovolt amperes that it can provide. And if we look at the log files, then we ha we uh, loaded uh, the, tra the transformer with 1500 kilovolt amperes. And why did it fail at 1400? And we learned something. We learned that uh, by the dust that was uh, all there, even though we kept the maintenance intervals, the, uh, the the dirt made the transformer so hot that it switched off. And then the other transformers tried to compensate, and they uh, couldn't compensate it, and then the whole house uh, threw off the power. And that was at eight hours uh, open house. And that has uh, occupied the queue until 2 a.m. Uh, there's also a diesel that is... Uh, for the uninterruptible power supply, that's also interesting. If we look at the whole system, if we look at this Linpack, uh, who cares about uh, uh, Linpack? Who cares if this is position eight? It's nice to uh, it's nice to say that we are at, uh, in the rank, and Linpack uh, tells us where the technology where the technology uh, state of the art is and we understand better how the uh, how the um, system performs under peak performance if we want to we can also use a different uh, benchmark and at, at the sssp benchmark we are uh, rank 1 at uh, bfs benchmark we are fifth rank that's but that's not it what we really want is to provide a system that the scientists can work with. This is nice to have this result in the LINPAC, but what we really want is that the scientists are able to do uh, things that they couldn't do before. So this is one of the examples. This is about phylogenetic trees. This is from uh, Alexis Stamataka, Stamataka, just, sorry, from Heidelberg. It's about insects and uh, their genome. His interest is how are these insects related? Can we can we relate the or can we can we find the relation between the different types of insects? And then, then we're going to try and figure out the uh, relationship between them. So he, he does sequencing and then alignment, and then he's trying to do trees. They're called phylogenetic trees. So. Because this is a lot of different uh, data points in the genome, you need a supercomputer for this. So this is the number of possible trees for 150 uh, species. It has 301 different digits. Just if you want to look at 150 different uh, species. And he was... The, the, the scientist was waiting on the supermicro to arrive because he knew he had the code. There was no computer that could run this. So he had to wait for supermoc in order to solve this type of scientific problem that he had. And it's not so much about the, um, the performance in itself. It's, it's more about the memory that it provides it because the, the data that he's crunching is so huge. And he, he needed to bring all of this together in, in order to solve this scientific problem. So well, wh wh what's in it for us? Well, not really. We just have to uh, supply him with the capability and support him. But this is, we, we, he was able to publish a paper in science. And this is the actual thing that we're after. So we did our job because we helped him get into it. And he did it on... Uh, on our computer. Well, now he said, if it if it works for the bugs, maybe it works for the birds. So he got another one out of it. This is not about, about much about money or uh, power. This is about getting capabilities that we didn't have before. So they just issued a new post stamp about a uh, simulation about uh, species and about the uh, phylogenetics of species and about uh, astrophysics. We provide them with things where they can do new methods. So this is another nice example. We got a lot of uh, good uh, prizes for this. 
So, for example, the, the highest performance computing price, we were in the finals. There, was, there were two different groups that worked together, the geophysics group from the LMU and the Institute for Informatics from the TU. Um, what they did was they simulated a volcano. They, they looked at the, uh, the shock waves from an earthquake within the volcano, and this is the kind of order of magnitude that we're talking about here. Those are 1.4 petaflops from 150,000 cores roundabout. This is about 44.5% of our peak performance. So in the normal run, they basically, they almost got 45% of our peak performance, which is, so we're, this is the point where we're asking, why are we doing this in Germany at all? This is, we're, we could basically go anywhere and work with them. For example, in Oak Ridge, we could go there and just have them calculate our things, but what we can't have is get the whole machine because they obviously have their own jobs that they want to run. So the, the differentiator for us is that we can actually provide the whole machine to someone. That's why we're doing it here locally. So if he really, really has something important, he can have the whole machine to himself. He can't do that anywhere else in this order of magnitude. This is why we get more progress this way. If I had another hour, I could just show you more examples, but I don't. The nice thing about it is the, the examples are all really different. Those are also the, uh, more applications where you can see the whole spectrum of things that we can do here. So computational fluid dynamics or astrophysics or uh, solid state physics, geophysics, uh, material science and so on. It's really interesting if you if you look at uh, the distribution of the computational time according to different disciplines. You can really see the uh, fluid mechanics needs the first third, physics needs the next third, and then the material sciences are next. Informatics is really small if you compare it. Those are things like AI or other things that are starting to grow in those kind of uh, in informatics, but in the computer science. But it's really interesting for me to see all the different uh, applications that these other disciplines are utilizing us for. So if you analyze what you get out of this and you see how many different uh, different sisters are being employed and what you can see here we've been uh, we've been computing for 7.6 billion hours there were 5.6 million jobs that were being processed and uh, 2,000 researchers as a client and the, the breadth of the applications that we see is unique worldwide if you really look at it what you see here this is our this is our uh, report on the whole system that you you can uh, take the barcode if you want to look at it. It shows all the different applications that you get out of this system. It's really interesting. You can download it if you want, if you're interested in that kind of thing. There's also a science symposium that we recently did where we show the applications of the future. There's really interesting new projects coming up. You can look it up on the website. So if you go back to the list, the top 500 supercomputers, the race for the fastest system, we're actually getting something that's very usable in regards to development of new technology and computing power. But in the end, this is something like Formula One. The, the, f the fastest computer is about as relevant as who won the latest race. <laughs> this is not something that all of science is going to uh, profit from. So we have to put this into relation into, into the kind of effect. It might be nice to go for a run with a Formula One car, but I really... I have a friend who's living in Ho Chi Minh City and he sent me this picture yesterday. This is the Kong Ho Street. 
if if I visit him, then we always do the our tra trips with the moped. There's the, when you're a tourist. There's no chance. You just have to walk around, and you can do things like this. Basic. This is a normal way to go to your office over there. This is uh, cheaper and faster than if they were taking a car together. It's just a relation. In, you just have to put it into relation of what you really want to do. So this is. And this gets me to my my last remarks. What I wanted to talk about, but I didn't have the time for. I, I knew this in advance, obviously. Um, what's the next step? We're all we're all uh, in front of the barrier with the 10 to the 15. What's the next step? So the next thing is the exascale, the exaflop barrier. Then after that, there is the zeta flop. Who who will reach it first? China, USA, or maybe Japan? They've already shown with the once before with the Earth Simulator that they can also do this kind of thing. So, next one, what's the, Europe, the, the European highest performance computing uh, system? Is the EU, EU Commission able to uh, get into the top three and do we really need it? Then there's also the European Processor Initiative. So, for example, do we do we care about all the security issues that we have with the uh, current generation of processors? Why would Europe then build its own processor? And would it be related to what we do? And the most important thing that we care about is what are we going to do with the the power that is dissipated from the system? For one, we're heating our own building, obviously. So that uses about 0.5% of the dissipated energy from the system that we use. So we have about 99.5% that we, that we still have use, no use for. And there's the idea that to use an adsorption cooling machine. So the question is, how do we make beer from this with the hot water from Simbamok? So this is a very Bavarian answer to the, to the question of how, what to do with the heat. This is a very interesting project for us. We already thought about the labels, so we're quite far in that uh, question. So this is the end for me. The, the the slides I've already uploaded. If you're interested, just look at them. Um, if you have questions, just ask. Thanks a lot for this interest uh, for this fascinating talk, uh, Dieter Kranzenmüller. If you have questions, please use the microphones one, two, three, four, five, and the internet. Uh, damn. Uh, I thought I could ask my question first. Thanks for the talk. Why did you compl decide completely against uh, extra GPU system? That's a good question. We didn't d decide against it. We we uh, specified what needs to be calculated on the system. There's a number of codes that already run, and that's what the uh, vendors uh, got, and they saw what you can uh, run on it. Of the uh, five vendors, there were four uh, that used accelerators, but the best performance we got without, um, with, without accelerators, and that's the best that came out of the competition. And I'm just as surprised as you are why this is like that. Thanks for the interesting talk. My question is, do really only people from uh, science and education run on stuff on it, or is there also military? Well, it's uh, science, it's, uh, it's research and uh, teaching. So it needs to be uh, from research or teaching. Uh, I need to return the question, is there military uh, in military research, is there anything that's scientifically relevant? <laughs> I have two questions. So, just one. Why did the guy with the bugs have to wait until the mock is completed? And why didn't he just use a different one? 
the Super MOOC was the first uh, computer that you could uh, compute uh, with all the properties. Uh, you also need the uh, interplay of uh, computational power, uh, memory and connectivity. And he knew that that was coming and it would have that cost, that capacity. You can possibly uh, compute that on larger systems, but the efficiency is a question. It's It was the best system for him to do it with. Thank you. The internet has a question. How much do the users of the systems have to know about the architecture and adjust their programs in order to maximize the performance they're going to get from the system? And are there differences in the performance they get? Yeah, to the second question, the best users are the physicists. That It wasn't serious, but uh, there are no metrics. It depends. There are enough programmers with that, uh, with more talent and with more brain capacity. You get, you can do better. There's no metric who's doing better or not. To the first question, you need to know a lot. You, it's not only evaluated uh, how that meets with the scientific requirements. Uh, how it's the, how a scientific is it? It's a question. It also has to fit the hardware architecture. So if somebody submits the code, it needs to, you need they need to uh, prove that it also scales because otherwise it's a waste of mon money. Because all, so all the factors have to have to match so that the system works accordingly. And yes, it's a lot of effort. We try to cover it uh, with a relatively large crew that uh, gets together with the uh, with the team and puts the puts together the code with them. Thanks for the talk again. You were saying that the system is cooled with water. What about the the transformers? They also dissipate power. That's right. The SuperMOOC, we also we still have fans. You see that on the on one of the pictures uh, of the SuperMOOC, where the in-row cooler fans that. Uh, the uh, network components, the hard disks, are still cooled with fans. Here in the in the in the aisle in the middle, there are the, uh, the there are the fans, and this is still a disadvantage. Uh, we told the they told the vendors that for the next system, we also need to do it. Uh, we also have a small uh, cluster which is Cool Mark Three, which uh, dissipates which uh, dissipates seven ninety seven percent of the. Uh, power uh, by water and the power supplies are in a cage uh, with uh, holes for the water to go through so you already we already cool all the components by water it's a very good question thank you you were pretty open about what's being calculated on the computer but you don't have an idea about what's being calculated on the other 10 in the top 10 list so when we look at the first four systems, it's Department of Energy or it's doing, it's working with the Chinese military, it's with mil military academies and we know, we don't know what, uh, we have an idea what they do, but uh, we don't really know. With the Swiss system, according to what you just said, it's uh, climate computations in the system, in the Swiss system, because... You have a special code in Lugano, so it's uh, very different for different for the different systems for the different target uh, target architectures. The nice thing about our system is the breadth that we can uh, run a whole whole spectrum of applications. No other system has that. Back to number two. So in relation to the question before about what's being calculated in the other 10 systems, at the beginning of the talk, you were saying about uh, uh, the, the bidding system for the vendors. What are the proposals being done for? And what information is in there? What's, what are you going to get from that? So let's take an example. Um, we have uh, 
in the moment we uh, we uh, sign the con contract, we already prepare the next system. We already uh, work. Uh, we already think uh, conceptually about the 2024 system. In order to, in order to do that. Uh, we need to uh, estimate what is available in 2024, so we have a non-disclosure with the uh, Intel and IBM uh, to have an insight into the road roadmaps beyond what is publicly known. It uh, gives uh, it. We need to uh, find uh, out what processes are coming to make a concept for the next design. It's uh, an interesting problem, but uh, there are people who can't talk uh, to us uh, with us uh, because it's necessary that we are very in deep involved, very in depth and uh, to what uh, what we need to have as a concept and we need to know the roadmap, we need to look into the future. So those are oh, so those, those are informations about the companies and not the uh, no, they're all uh, handwritten codes, it's uh, very open, it's a nice community and if you go very deep in the code and if we optimize that that's where we get involved. Another question on the internet. How large is the proportion or how much of what you're doing is political, how much is scientific? That's a very good question. Um, so officially, I'm doing only 25% of, of my time in the, in, the co in the computational center and the rest of the time I'm a teacher for distributed systems, a university teacher. So 25% of my working time is four, day, four, four days a week, so you get an impression. And I wouldn't estimate it, I won't complain. I have a dream job, I have a uh, understanding family that allows me to be here, for example, where, while the family is at home. I'm here because out of scientific interest, because of the uh, privacy and ethics uh, that is um, that is also come has related with the job, and of course I have to do uh, be a little uh, science manager. That's also in the whole paragraphs. It's not nothing more uh, more sleep inducing than paragraphs. Uh, I don't know if other people are like that. Hi. I'm interested in the, uh, the, the operating costs that are part of the budget. How long is the computer system going to run for and what's going to happen to it afterwards? So that's very simple. It usually doesn't pay off. Uh, uh, operating a computer like longer than six years, uh, that was SuperMOOC in 2012. Uh, inst we installed that in 2012, and uh, uh, the day after tomorrow, it's getting switched off. And in that, at that time, the Super Mac and G takes over the load. So that's the next uh, processor generation with the code port porting. Uh, there is a difficulty. We have a system here, and uh, it's too expensive to operate it longer. And uh, we, in all those contracts, we have uh, return options, so the companies can take it back. And if we compare that to the system before the supermarket was trashed in in place, and the uh, the material, the valuable materials were recycled, that's uh, cheaper than uh, just to continue operating it. Uh. Someone said they have a power PC at home. That might be an ideal opportunity for you. Hi. How often? Does someone have to walk up to a rack and uh, do some maintenance on it? Uh, basically, uh, the double cube is a dark center. There is no offices there, nobody in there. Uh, at the supermarket, G, it's like uh, that a lot of things has to be done in the installation phase, in the normal operation. It goes down, effort goes down. We need to think about the uh, number of components. The mean time between failure between uh, was at the SuperMOOC was less than one hour. We had uh, one critical failure within one uh, hour. We can do most of the thing from desk, from the desk. So one every once a day, uh, somebody needs to walk over and uh, do some maintenance in place. How loud is it in there? Just of interest, if you have a water cooling. Good question. This is actually the the, the, the quietest system because there are no fans. Uh, just uh, we are at a point. 
where in the aisles we have interviews and the normal camera uh, cancels the background noise. You don't get that in any other center. <laughs> Next Tatar comes. Uh Thanks for the talk. You showed that there was a very, very long running competition. It was using 50% of the first phase. Is it actually worth it to up the the um, the performance by 10% if if you really don't use it that much so really uh, ex used uh, effectively or totally is we we, we all use it uh, correctly even if it only reaches 10% of the maximum power because you can still do things that you can't do ha can't have couldn't have done before in science now the systems are so big the softer the data that you're using you're uh, making them so large that they can just be uh, calculated on the system and on the volcanoes certain effectors uh, effects and the Heiner Eagle talk uh, in the science symposium he shows that in his transparency interest per transparency he shows he doesn't see some effects there are some effects he doesn't see because he can't uh, calculate that those uh, cal resolutions that means that the theoretical maximal peak power is a fictive, a ficti fictional number that uh, is useless in principle. But the 44% use utilization is relatively high compared to what else runs on it. It's not about uh, it's not about filling the system consciously to uh, to maximum capacity. Somebody only needs uh, 300 cores from the 311. It's, we don't fill it up. Uh, so the next guy who gets the uh, that the next guy gets a system that um, can fill it up. So we take into 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 account the holes and we don't uh, use it up like Amazon because they're revenue based. Here it's science and here it's make to make science possible. And we close the talk with this question and. Uh, a lot of applause for Dieter Kanzelmüller. That's also our finishing line. This was Kaste. Kaste.